Thank you very much. And again, uh, as well as my predecessor's happy anniversary to Trulka. I think something we have in common in this panel is that all of us, including our Irish friend, have a love affair with this uh, Green Island um, to which I began visiting 20 years ago, invited by Trulka. I still remember when I would speak in every single mass on Sunday between Dublin and Cork <laughs> for the Lenten campaign. Um, I think it is also appropriate to remember other anniversaries. This year is also the 65th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And just recently, the last living author of that declaration died, Stefan Hessel, who I had the, time, uh, the privilege of meeting at UNESCO because he was constantly being invited uh, by UNESCO in Paris to attend their, their, their events. And Stefan was part of the resistance, the French resistance against the Nazi occupation during the Second World War. And he says in his stories, he says, it was the indignation I had against fascism, the imposition of violence and the imposition of domination and the atrocities that were, that were applied upon the people of Europe and the selecting individuals because of their religion in the case of the Jewish people or because of their race in case of the Roma people or against other people, against their ideologies or against children with disability that were, first, that were the first victims of the Second World War. It was that indignation that moved me to be part of the resistance, he said. And it is that that moved me later to work on human rights. Well, right before he died, he was also did a couple of interviews and a couple of writings, and I have this one in Spanish, but just to show it's called Indignaos, and it's a call to indignation. Because he said right before dying now, 65 years later after the Universal Declaration, this is the time to express our indignation again. If we look at the advances of the world when we talked about human rights, when we drafted that first document that then evolved into many more documents, and you see human rights as a constantly evolving doctrine and theory and legislation, you also have to pale and suffer in looking at the world today, he says, where greed is basically rampant, where the world markets have collapsed because of a speculation, where people are suffering because they lost their pensions and their retirement funds. And he says this is again or where we're losing the environment, as the professor this morning pointed us out, because greedy people want to exploit the environment or, or oftentimes governments want to turn their head around and look a different direction. He says, this is again a time to express our indignation. We're not at war, he says, as we were in the Second World War, but we do have to form a new form of peaceful resistance, he says. The world, again, has to change. And that was interesting for me to have someone who drafted the first sort of the first big document of our era in terms of human rights, how this man was able to influence the world and to establish these precedents. Also, we have another anniversary. This is the 20th anniversary yes, of the Vienna Declaration of 1993, where all the world came together to establish the fundamental standards of human rights. And we talked about how human rights are equal amongst themselves, are universal, are interrelated and interdependent, a doctrine that still exists today. I think all this is very relevant to the issue of development that we're talking about today, to the Millennium Development Goals, but the work on development in general. Because at the same time, I believe that today, human rights have to be seen as the evolution of protecting life in all its expressions and protecting human dignity. This is especially valid for us of us that are Christians and for those that are people of faith or for institutions that come from the church and from the social teachings of the church itself. But at the same time, it is part of the doctrine of human rights. No matter what religion people are, we are protecting life and abundant life in different expressions, and we are protecting dignity of human beings. When we talk about development, we're talking about something similar. We're talking about improving the living standard of individuals 
so they can have a decent life, but also they can have respect and full respect for that human dignity, no matter in what corner of the world we were born, no matter what race, what culture, what language, what religion we practice. So the link between human rights and development that was not so clear before, I think gets clearer and clearer today. I cannot conceive anyone working on development without having a human rights focus to that. With the benefit that human rights become an absolute issue that can be demanded. It becomes not only the issue of goodwill of the governments of any country or of in, even of international cooperation, but it becomes an issue of a legitimate right of the people to receive, to demand. Now, of course, we're talking that all the rights are equal. Yes, and I believe that. That's always difficult for us that are rapporteurs because we all think that our mandate, our particular right we work in is especially relevant. But one of the things we did come to terms with is the fact that some rights are facilitating other rights. And I came to the conclusion that although all human rights are equal and that development should be seen from the exercise of rights of the people, because that way is not seen in a passive way, we're not throwing out something to the people, but is the people demanding and exercising a right, which I think is the, the most dignified approach. But at the same time, some rights play a facilitating role. And in that sense, for me, in the facilitating role, the most important right is the right to participate. And obviously, and this may be self-serving for me, but the right to participate goes hand in hand, of course, with the right to freedom of expression, of expressing one's opinion and one's demands or denouncing uh, the, the lack of or denouncing corruption or denouncing the lack of justice or the last lack of accessibility to decisions, to political decisions in the state. And this, why do I say this? Jan in this panel talked about ownership, which I, I love the concept because the only programs, he said, the Millennium Development Goals or any future goals that are established or any development program will only work if the people of a nation have the chance to build and incorporate an ownership of those plans. Well, that's exactly what participation gives. Plans have to become not something that is being given to the people. Plans have to be something that are drafted with the population, whether they be in the economic life of the country, where they be the political decisions, or whether they be the economic decisions of that nation. And for me, this is the only formula for success. If people feel they're participants, if they can give their opinion, if they can comment, this is what will make any goal, whether they be the MDGs or future goals, successful. It's not so much going to be the high-level commission, although I respect very much their work, and I think they're doing great work, but it's going to be the fact whether the peoples of the world understand those goals and feel that they were consulted and that they were taken into account and whether they can raise their voices. Because here's where we have to listen and learn to listen. Because the voices we have to hear are the voices of women who are demanding, women that are most oftentimes in developing nations, the, the, the head of a family, the sustainability of a family, Women, they are demanding equal access to jobs, equal salary, and equal opportunity. Or women who are raising their voices to denounce violence and to break impunity. Or children who are raising their voices to ask their first questions in life or their first opinions. But in, in doing that, they're learning to think and to present themselves to the world and to be able to have the self-assurance that their, their opinion is important and they will be able to participate, depending on how respectful we are to their opinions. Or the voices of indigenous peoples who are being violated and suffering violence for raising their voices against international corporations that are mining and raping the land and mining the resources. Or minorities around the world from racial, cultural, linguistic, religious minorities to people with disability or sexual orientation, different sexual orientation, that are being discriminated upon just 
for the fact that they're different. These are the voices that we have to empower, we have to listen. So when I talk about human rights, I do talk about obligations of the state, but I talk about obligations of the state that have to be built into a national consensus in every nation of the world and have to be built into domestic legislation. And then I think we talk about also accountability. Those voices that are being raised are also those voices that will fight against corruption and oppression or, or against those that are denying those rights. Bishop Dumas was telling us today that corruption is one of the worst problems in, around the world. It is. Those that are in power have been misusing our resources. Those that are in political power, but now we are understanding that also those that are in economic power also misuse the resources. And on top of that, they're getting bonuses for, for what they did. So I believe, I believe that this is the time to raise the voices and to actually denounce this corruption and to demand transparency. This, as well, is a right, a human right. It is, I'm thinking in Spanish, but it's the exigibilidad, the fact that you can demand the exercise of rights, which makes the rights approach so important. And let me add a new element. The optional protocol on the international covenant on economic, we all know that there is an optional protocol on civil and political rights, which is why we have a human rights committee to look at the exercise of the rights or to look at the specific complaints uh, for violating the rights of the, of, of, the, of the covenant. But recently, the optional protocol on the international covenant on social, economic, and cultural rights was ratified by 10 nations, which was the standard that had been set to come into effect. So now 10 nations, out of which, by the way, five are from Latin America, uh, will come into effect on May 5th. So now this optional protocol also gives legal mechanisms in which there will be a possibility of demanding and denouncing the lack of respect for economic, social, and cultural rights. So we'll, we will also have a committee for precisely working those rights. And we will have the ECOSOC working and, and, and the mechanisms established for that within the UN system. And obviously, they should be established within the different countries themselves. This, I think, is the biggest challenge. The challenge of understanding that we're talking about life and dignity that are supposed to be equal to all, and therefore that life and dignity generating equal rights for all. And before there used to be the idea that civil and political rights were immediate, that you would could demand them immediately, and economic and social rights, you would have to wait for a while because they take time. And even worse, environmental rights would be the third generation. That's no longer the case, and that's not a theory accepted anymore. All rights are equal, but all rights are immediate. That doesn't mean that a government of a nation can build housing for everyone immediately, but it does mean that the right exists immediately. We don't have to wait to have a right. We have it by being human beings. And we can demand it from our government just by being born in a particular society with no discrimination of caste, class, or social origin. And that should be ingrained in every single child as they grow up. We have the right to demand these rights. I remember one reading about Nelson Mandela, this was not his phrase, but he was sitting in a desk with a big board in the back that had a phrase that impressed me very much. There was, an, in a way, an inspiration for me on the question of freedom of expression. It says, evil triumphs when people of goodwill keep silent. And it is true. This is the time to break that silence and the time where we cannot allow evil or corruption or pillage to exist in the world because everyone in the world has a right. Now, let me show off a little bit and taking advantage of the fact that the new pope is from Latin America. <laughs> um, in his homily of the first mass, he did say, let us be, well, he actually began, please, he says, I would like to ask those who have positions of responsibility in economic, 
political and social life, and all men and women of goodwill, let us be protectors. He's talking about rights. We're prote because in, in human rights, you talk about the protection and promotion of rights. He says, let us be protectors of the creation, protectors of God's plan inscribed in nature, protectors of one another and of the environment. And he beautifully, further on in his homily says, only those who serve with love will be able to protect. Thank you very much.